Bespoke Radio for the Masses. Headline edition, July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. If the game is rigged, change the game. Game changer. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. This is Fade to Black with your host, Jimmy Church, on the Game Changer Radio Network. All right. Good evening, Fade to Black. Yeah. Today is Wednesday. We are now officially in November. Next month is Christmas. Where did the year go? Today is November 1st, 2023. And tonight, our guest, Jason Martell. We're going to be talking about my favorite subject tonight, time, with one of my favorite bestest friends, Jason Martell. It's going to be a great night tonight. Always look forward to hanging out with Jason. We're going to be doing all of that. I want to remind everybody what's going on. November 10th, 11th, and 12th, 10 days from today, we are getting together in Las Vegas, Nevada for Stairway to the Stars. The links for everything are below, Disclosure Fest. I've got a promo code for you to get discounted tickets. All of that is below. Jason's going to be there. I've got the cast from Ancient Aliens is going to be there. Robert Clotworthy. Man, when was the last time you saw Robert Clotworthy at a conference? Well, as in never. That's how great it's going to be. So come and hang out with us. We're going to Area 51. Uh, We've got a dinner gala. Uh, We've got uh, a movie theater set up. We've got so many exciting things uh, that are going on at the Luxor Hotel. So come and hang out with us. Jason's going to be there, and he's kind of hard to miss. But if you want to meet Jason, come find me, and uh, I'll make sure that you get your selfie. All right? All right. And uh, so, yeah, tonight we're talking about time and uh, the lost cycle of time. And what does all of that mean, not only for us today and the future, but also in the deep, distant past? We're going to be doing all of that because for over 15 years, he's been one of the leading researchers and lecturers specializing in ancient civilization technologies. His research has been featured worldwide on numerous television and radio networks. Of course, the Discovery Channel, Sci-Fi Channel, and the BBC. He is currently and has always been a regular guest on Ancient Aliens on the History Channel. And uh, also, you got to check out his book, Knowledge Apocalypse. His website, it's right there. The link is right there, jasonmartell.com. And I would like to welcome back to Fade to Black, the one and only. Here he comes, Jason Martell. (laughs) How you doing, brother? What's up, Jimmy? I'm doing great, man. Thank, thanks for having me on. And I apologize. As I mentioned, I just moved, so I don't have a super rad background like you do. But, yeah, I'm stoked to be on the show, man. It, it'll be rad soon enough. It'll be rad soon enough because you're Jason Martell. But <laughs> but here's <laughs> – here's oh, man. You know, one of, uh, uh, one of the things that uh, I have always appreciated um, about uh, you and our friendship – is that you and I have always just sat down and just talked, right? That's what we've done. We just sit down and we talk, not only on the show, but I just mean in general. And and we've done a lot of hanging out over the years. And I was talking about you. I'm going to bring up something strange, and then we're going to get to uh, uh, the cycle of time. You came up to my house for dinner, and we cooked out all night, uh, and and it was a fantastic time. But at that dinner, I had a friend. His name was Javier from high school in Panama, in Central America, and um, and it was great to have him meet you because he was a big fan of ancient aliens. But I hadn't seen Javier since I was like 15 years old, right? And he's sitting there at the table. And he says, Jimmy, do you remember when we had the crew together, me, you, Rocky, and Alan, and and, and Bill, and we were all together out in the jungle, and you saw the flying saucer above us? And I go, what? 
And he goes, yeah, man, it was right there and it was silver and it was lit up and it had lights going around it. And you were freaking out. And you're like, Javier, I don't, I, I don't remember that. And, and Javier trying to convince me that, uh, you know, that I, that, that it was me. And I believe that it was me. I just don't remember it. You were sitting there listening. And when you hear something like that um, and with the UFO subject, that experience is not a strange one, is it? it? Where you go through the experience, but then there's like missing time. Could I, right? Could I have been abducted or maybe all over, whatever it is? But here it was so profound for him, and it should have been profound for me. He remembered it, and I didn't. These stories just repeat themselves, don't they? They really do. Yeah. It's, it's definitely a theme in ufology from the Betty and Barney Hill case all the way up. Um, you know, it's, it's funny too. Uh, you know, re- remembering people and such uh, and talking what you just brought up there, a couple of people come to my mind because I have their books right here and I'm staring at them. But do you remember Dr. Roger Lear? Um, got his book here, Aliens in the Scalpel. There it is. There it is. Uh, yeah, he he um, he had a lot of that type of uh, involvement with cases where people had some type of an implant, uh, firmly believed that they were an abductee. You know, Whitley Strieber, a few others got involved. I got to be a fly on the wall. This was, you know, 15 years ago before I was doing ancient aliens research. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's a thematic theme. Uh, it's very thematic throughout ufology. Uh, so you have to wonder other than why we hear these things happening, which is sometimes we have a blanket memory. Don't remember anything. Uh, instead of an alien coming through the window, you remember a big squirrel or an owl. So. Yeah. You know, and I so wanted to remember it and I thought about it so much since then I dude, I'm drawing a blank. Right. Well, and and he's got it, he's got it down to details, right? He remembers I, I don't even remember ever you telling me this story. I was I at that dinner? Are you sure? Because <laughs> this is a pretty fantastic story. Yeah, uh, but, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I can relate to, to many fantastic things that we have gone through, and I'll I'll pop another one. I'll pop the ping pong back to you. Contact in the desert. Um, you know, like seven years ago. Uh, some of the initial ones, I, I can't remember the exact date, but uh, there's now a video, out, a video out there called Rise of the TR-3B. And it shows over a couple of the times when we were out there at contact, standing in a group of 50 with light lasers oh, right. and, uh, and you goggles. And I, you and I, right, right, right. right a whole right. bunch of people. Apparently in this video, Rise of the TR-3B, it shows a huge triangular object the whole time, just sitting over the conference. Don't know if that's valid footage, but yes, we've seemed to be surrounded by events that even in the forethought are revealed to us as, wow, that was trippy. So yeah, rise of the TR3B, it's fully documented where these things show up. Not saying it's valid footage, but it's good enough coming from independent cell phone cameras that something was floating above the skies at the exact time we were there having those experiences. Oh, it, they, they don't show us and our crowd. No, no. They it's much that. further okay. zoomed out, and you just see a huge triangular craft sitting there silent. Right, right. Was that when um, I was on the PA system? Yes, yes. Okay, so right. do, do, you hear, do you hear my voice in I the video? Uh, oh. Yeah. Oh, no, oh. no, no, you don't. We're, we're, the video's much further pulled back from oh, the Oh, it's conference. further it's away like, because that, like, that, the reason why I bring that up is because that would certainly, I we could pinpoint the exact day. Oh, my God. Yeah, well, that would be really trippy, but you can definitely see it's the, it, it's the valley there. So it makes a lot of sense that from, from whatever we're seeing, uh, the overlap of that footage and our event in the timetable matching, I was like, oh, okay, that's, if that's not fake, it's it's way more than a coincidence based upon the multiple things that were happening. We were kind of waiting for like a large craft like that to just visualize. We were, we were and we were seeing stuff all night that night, yeah. uh, and which was a lot of fun. And to hear, 
you know, that group of people yelling and screaming when these things were appearing up in the sky. And some of it that that night with you, some of it was pretty dang cool. And it, but that was here. That's just one night with you and I hanging out with a bunch of friends. Right. And we're seeing stuff. But today, you know, it's our own little private thing. But today, everybody is talking about it. And it's the same phenomenon, the same descriptions that you and I and everybody else witnessed together. But now it's no longer our little private thing. It's everybody is talking about it. And why do you think it took so long to get the attention of the media and the government? I think it's just like everything else in our topic. It's a dissemination of information at the right time. The last time the the military the Navy, Air Force, let's just say that, came out with anything new besides the B-2 and the stealth bomber, uh, you know, the F-117 and such. We haven't really seen anything. We know we've been working on stuff, right? So there's been rumors of an Aurora, other things. I think what we're getting glimpses of now, that which obviously we've been testing for a long time, is the TR-3B is the classic nuclear-powered triangular craft, three lights, something center-powered in the middle, I don't know what it is, but there's enough of a technical you know, description and understanding that we call it a TR-3B. So that my guess is that the next phase of craft that they're going to release are trans-atmospheric vehicles. They can go in our atmosphere and also outside of the atmosphere. You know, in the days of Area 51, a B-2, a stealth, uh, you know, stealth technology, they always flew their craft at the least statistical time that people would be outside, which was like, 3 a.m. on Wednesday nights. That doesn't matter anymore, right? Everyone has satellites from every country. So now, where the heck do you fly your new cool spacecrafts and such? You fly them above the satellites in space. So that's what's it's going a, on. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. It's that simple. And if we look at, um, and I've, I've mentioned this before on the show, but uh, I'm, I'm going to say it again because it sets up my next uh, question, where we're going to go. Um, you and I, one night, we were um, in Hollywood on the roof of a hotel, and we were just sitting there staring at the stars, and uh, and we were laying down, and as we're looking up at the stars, you and I were talking about E.T. and if we're alone, and we're doing what everybody has done all the time throughout their life, you look up at the stars and go, man, I wonder if there's anybody looking back at us. And, and you and I had that conversation that night uh, till the wee hours in the morning. And it was, it was amazing. But here's the thing with that. We're talking like that today, you know, on the sunset strip, but the contact with this planet, especially with the size of the universe has had to have gone on for millions of years. This isn't a modern phenomenon, is it? No, there's such huge gaps in time. And that's why we'll talk about the lost cycle of time loosely, more some ancient mapping and time frames for helping people understand time frames. But you know, there's there's large gaps of time missing. I mean, literally 30 to 100 million year gaps where we're just like, whew, have no idea what happened. You talk about the dinosaurs disappearing. I mean, there's enough time that maybe some of them literally evolved and left the planet, right? Or we hear all types of, you know, stories about the biblical representations of good and evil. And it's like angels fighting these demonic beings. Well, what if they're not demons? What if they're reptilian? And what if they're actually from Earth? And maybe they just now live underground. We don't know. But there's enough in our mythology of options to say, did they go to space? Did they go underground? Did they evolve to something else? We don't know. Um, but there's enough time for us to scratch our heads and be like, wow, we should be really humble about trying to understand our place. Because we're just, you know, like the mayfly, it's got a 24-hour lifespan here on Earth. You know, and it's like it doesn't understand the context of time. If it if it's born on a cloudy day, it's only going to live 24 hours. Another mayfly might come up and it's like, I don't see any sunshine or wind. What were you talking exist. about? Yeah. Right, you know, so yeah, we don't yeah, have the yeah. context. 
That's a very interesting point that you just made. And I hadn't really, man, I'm going to lay awake tonight thinking about this, (laughs) that the dinosaurs may have evolved. They had the time to do it enough to get off this planet before the asteroid hit that that's crazy maybe maybe that's who's visiting us back now now let's take let's take that a step further the asteroid doesn't hit that means humans don't evolve the atmosphere doesn't change right we're not here but dinosaurs survive for 75 more, million more years do they in turn evolve into the internet and an interstellar species over those 75 million years. What, what would be here today if that asteroid didn't hit? Would, would species have evolved into an alternate intelligent, advanced uh, species and, and life form? You know, I just, anyone fascinated by this topic, watch the original 80s version of the TV series V. Yes. <laughs> and just yes. leave that right there. Mic drop. Yeah, exactly. It's like they come back, they look like us. Surprise, surprise. You peel off their skin. They're a bunch of lizards, you know. It's yeah. Like, oh my God, what's happening? But, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm being light about it, but again, there's enough of the evidence for us to question these types of facts because we really don't understand the timetables in our short lifespan currently. Now, why is it um, okay? I, I want to talk about the lost cycle of time, and we've got to get. We already uh, are, but we just lost. What, yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> um, we need to get into a definition, though, um, because we have a few key words there: um, lost. We have cycle, and then we have time. Three different things, but we're they're going together. And now to mean something, what's the definition of the lost cycle of time? Well, I, mean, I could give you a, a dry definition, I will, but we're also going to divulge into some of like what you just did there is breaking it down, maybe not phonically, but based on the research that ties that all together. So the lost cycle of time is a simple explanation to say that over 30 ancient cultures measured a system of time watching the movement of the stars, making monuments that align to certain constellations, a system of time that consisted of over 24,000 years. Now, today, we we have a technical term for it, which is called the precession of the equinox. But everyone may have also heard of the 12 houses of the zodiac. We have 12 constellations. Pretty much every 2,000 years, we're pointing to a new one of these as our North Star. And so the ancients were aware of this very esoteric understanding of celestial mechanics and basically said in very simple terms that there's a rise and fall of civilization here on Earth because most likely we are in what what we, we would call a binary orbit. So some of the most earliest sculptures, even from Sumerian times, uh, the biblical uh, building the Tower of Babel, In the Sumerian epic of this, there are Sumerian reliefs and clay that the Tower of Babel is reaching at the top two suns. So many of these ancient cultures reflected knowledge of two suns, which means we may also be in a binary system. And our two suns, one is way out there and is a dark star, or it could be another system like Sirius A and B. We don't know yet, but it seems like we could be in some type of an intricate dance that When our suns are at their closest point, we're in the golden age. Something happens to the energy that transforms us at an evolutionary level where we advance. Uh, Some of the ancient Hindu texts talk about man reaches a time when he can interpret God. We're nowhere there close yet in the cycle, but it's a very esoteric topic that seems to be documented by ancient cultures to understand that because of these cycles and orbits, when the suns are at their farthest, we're in the dark ages. When they're at their closest, we're in the golden age. And it's a cyclical process that we're affected by. So that, in a nutshell, got me hooked, especially coming from Planet X background and the celestial mechanics there and understanding there are larger models at play here. 
Now, to um, the numbers boggle the mind. Okay, so if we start with the the micro side of this, um, which uh, let's just talk about like one year of this twenty four thousand and change cycle. Now and and then down to the days of that, right? Let's go down to the micro because this is this is where it's difficult for me to believe the historians and and the way that they present our own history to us in school, which is this. It's and it, stop me at any point if I get uh, if I get it wrong and and just feel f- free to correct me. But every seventy two years is one degree, correct? That's correct, okay. based so, on their so, model. <laughs> okay. yes. Right, 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 right. Okay, so 72 years is one degree. 72 years to me is a generation. That's a life. So that long ago, you would spend, you were designated right the watcher of the shadow right and you're going to you're going to have a stick in the ground whatever and you're going to spend your life watching that and then wait for a degree to pass you're going to teach this to your son and he's going to pick it up and then the next 72 years you got another stick in the ground and then it it, it and it's like wait a minute it couldn't have happened that way because they compiled this knowledge. They didn't do it one year, you know, at a time to 72 years, measuring one degree over a 72 year period to get the information of the procession that is 24,400 years, right? That that doesn't make any sense to to develop the cycle, which they did, and clearly many cultures did, they didn't do it that way, did they? No, no. And it's, you know, and there's a lot of, again, evidence across cultures, even Egyptian, which we were just talking about before the show. And maybe you'll make a comment about this, which is in Dendera, uh, right, where we have the light bulbs and such. There's also the huge ceiling relief of an astronomical relief of the sky, which is a lot more drawn out and shows different constellations. But it's at a view that's like 8000 years ago. It has no relation to 2500 bc it's like why would they make a sky print that you know is thousands of years uh, before their recorded time of being there so it's either a marker of something important in the past or again it's uh, you know it pinpoints it, it 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 points i should say towards a larger cycle of time which the pyramids in egypt and other monuments are clearly a part of now I've got a picture of that that I took last week, and uh, I'm going to pull it up. And if I don't pull it up now, I'll pull it up during the break. Nice. Uh, uh, and then I'll email it to myself, and then I'll pop it up uh, for the show here. But I stood underneath that and and really, really studied it and and took it all in. First off, it's not small. Okay, it's about. I'm going to say eight foot square and, and the room that it's in um, you can, it's low enough to you that you can see all of the details of it. The, car, and, the, bump, the bumps and carving and dude, you can see it. Perfect. You can see it. And it's, it is the craziest. Okay. I've, I'll, I'll look for it later. Um, it's the craziest. You know what you're looking at? You're looking at a frigging Zodiac. You're not looking okay. at what you, you, you know what I mean? That you, uh, your mind is contaminated because somebody's told you it's a Zodiac. So you see it and you squint your eyes and you go, oh yeah, I can kind of see it. No, 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 it's right. It's that it's huge. It's okay. huge. Um, now, when, yeah. Yeah. Well, go ahead, go ahead. Thousand. Yeah. It's, it's uh 5,000, 6,000 BC allegedly. If, if you line it up correctly. Now, and so when you asked earlier about like the lost cycle of time, there's many facets of this, which, you know, discussing tonight, some of the evidence we have, a lot of these questions have become more esoteric and prominent since, since like Graham Hancock getting, you know, uh, not, I was gonna say knowledge apocalypse, <laughs> ancient apocalypse, 
uh, on Netflix talking about the same topic of there seems to be strong evidence of some type of 10,000 BC lost race, right? Something that some some existence of people um, that were here. And there's lots of ways to deduce this evidence. And one of the ways that I'd like to at least share with your audience, and I know you have a trip coming up, so it seems to overlap well, two things. One is ancient maps. And the other part of this is, is geological data. So, you know, when we look at maps like the Perry Reese map, um, you know, it was found in like 1929. It was drawn on a gazelle skin. Uh, it was, you know, by a very prized possession of a Turkish admiral. He admit that it was comprised of a series of other sources, um, you know, coming coming from uh, way back in the past. Uh, uh, but what's interesting about the Perry Reese map is it shows what appear to be are the connecting the continents still connected uh, at a time when man was traversing and making transatlantic contact. And it shows very accurately the topography at the poles underneath the ice, the actual ground level. So a lot of these things, and there's other maps too. You know, we have the Phineas map, the Perry Reese map, uh, Charles Hapgood map. A lot of these, again, they show the topography of the land mass from above, but also underneath the ice. You've got to have somehow ground penetrating radar. You'd have to be above the surface, you know, at least, uh, you know, a half a mile above the earth to do this type of mapping. So a lot of those pieces raise the question of who who gave them this knowledge, right? Yeah, where did, where did it come from? Especially, uh, you know, the Perry Reese map, which is dated to, uh, you know, just uh, right around 1500, you know, 14th century, and that uh, it was compiled from a, a series of maps that have been collected. Uh, uh, it, it wasn't only Turkey, right? This was uh, throughout Persia and, and the Middle East and the Mediterranean. And that's what they would do, these map makers. And they would share their information. And that's where the Perry Reese map, we call it Perry Reese because of its, its new owner, but um, it was Turkish, like you said. And uh, compiled from information much, much older than when that map was drawn in the 1500s. And it shows, like you just said, Antarctica without the ice. Now, this is, this is the mind-blowing part. Antarctica wasn't even known about until Russia bumped into it in 1817 right? <laughs> and, and that's it and they didn't even go ashore they just saw it they were right like, we yeah 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 looks pretty that cool was, let's, uh, let's not go there the 450 years after the Perry Reese map was drawn and we we really have to stop and take that into consideration this isn't luck this isn't coincidence this isn't map uh imagination this is what uh the navigators used and the captains of those ships to make it around the world it's really that that simple isn't it it is and if you watch movies like the latest indiana jones and you understand that the antikythera mechanism may not have done time travel but it was an advanced mechanism to help them navigate as well as understand the complexities of the movements of the heavens so part part of that i think is us as you know armchair astronauts uh, have the ability to confirm some of this data just looking at google maps and i'll give you an example if you compare the astronomical and geological data of some of these sites uh, like giza for an example it in the past it's always talked about that the Nile came to like right at the foot of the pyramids. They would, the Pharaoh would come down, load up his boat and cruise down the Nile. If you look at the way the Nile is from the pyramids now, it's neandered so far away that I wonder again, is that not geological evidence to further date more accurately the time frame that that you know probably took? And, it, and it's and it's the same thing with other areas, right? So. You, you talk about going to tu, uh, Cusco and Puma Punco, Teotihuacan, uh, uh, Teotihuacan and such. I think it's very interesting that, again, if you look at a Google map of Lake Titicaca, you see this little tiny body of water. But at the footprint of where it used to stretch all the way up to 
Cusco, Machu Picchu, and some of these sites where, again, the waters maybe lapped at the shores of these ancient sites. So again, Jimmy, I just think it's interesting that the geological data of what we're looking at and the time scales of change account for something for what we're what we're talking about in our field. Yeah, that's a that's a crazy thought, isn't it? How did they get these stones up here to Machu Picchu? Uh, they did it by boat, right? <laughs> they they just rode up uh, to. Yeah, that's that is a crazy crazy thought. That is uh, something that we all have to think about. And and the other part, if we go back to the cycles of time, where the, the number 10,500 sticks out everywhere, it's not just one culture. It's just not one point in history uh, that one culture we're focusing on. Um, it's, it's all of the cultures uh, around the world, and everything keeps coming back to 10,500 B.C., and the the ability to measure the constellations and where we are in relation to the because we're dealing with a the tilt of the earth second the the stars and the seasons are happening and the stars are in a different place in the sky so it takes a lot of time and i would say in some cases you're better at this than i am but to figure out what part of the cycle of time that you're in versus what constellation is up in the sky. In some cases, we're talking about hundreds of years. And how do those ancient astronomers compile this knowledge unless somebody taught it to them? Wow, you brought up so many good things there. Ancient man used the time of halakhlial rising to see exactly what constellation is rising against the sun, the age of Pisces, the age of Aquarius. And so they could just simply see what a what constellation is rising in the backdrop of the sun. Uh, there were many different methods of trying to calculate, you know, uh, the phases of this approach. And it's interesting how modern science today again uses, you know, the the equinox as as a symbol. But all the ancient cultures used a much more symbolic approach of looking at the system of time. Um, you know, the effects of this time, too, are really an interesting and articulated point in many of the cultures. They said that there were three cycles in this cycle of time. Cycle one is the Earth is spinning on its axis. Now, we don't think about that, right? But because of that spin, it causes a day and night cycle here on Earth. You literally lose consciousness, which I'll probably do here in a few hours, because <laughs> of this shift, right? It gets dark out and you just go to sleep, all the plants, all the animals on the planet because of an astronomical movement, cycle one affects us, but we don't really think about it that way. Cycle two, the earth is going around the sun and this 365 degree cycle causes what? Seasonal changes, plants to you know die and grow, animals migrating, right? So a lot of activity happening because simply we're going around the sun. Cycle three, is that because we're in this longer binary orbit that there's a rise and fall of civilization here on earth. And we just don't understand that part because the 24,000 year cycle is, you know, so long. Now we can look metaphorically at like the movie or the TV show, like game of Thrones, right? That's pretty much the freaking dark ages, you know, no understanding of spiritual knowledge, all just, you know, are getting it, you know, through, physical consumption. Whereas at the higher end of the scale, um, again, man reaches a point where he's uh, aligned and, and pretty much able to communicate with many different spirits, you know, and higher dimensional beings. So a lot of times people ask, well, where are the aliens today? You know, I don't know why they're not here publicly, but one of the answers might be because of this cycle, you know, we're just coming out of the last dark ages, just a few thousand years. We got another like 8,000 years till the next golden age from this cycle's perspective. Aliens right now are looking at us going, woo, let's uh, give a little more time to mature there. You know, because from a time perspective, a lot of things change here, Jimmy, right? So I'm going to use a, I'm going to use a heavy name here, but let's say Jesus, yes. Jesus Christ from the biblical, you know, term was, let's say he was an Anunnaki. And if he came here, 
from Nibiru. And now again, I'm just stretching some facts here, but let's say Jesus was an Anunnaki from Nibiru and he came here and went through a spiritual experience of a resurrection and, you know, shed his body and, and, and then, you know, came back and said, Hey, I'm, I'm, I will be, I will return. Right. And let's say 3,600 years go by and Jesus returns and, and people are like, wow, this is amazing. Now, Jesus will still look like Jesus because here on earth, one cycle of the sun, 365 days. On Nibiru, one cycle of our sun is 3,600 of our years. So if you were to pop over to Nibiru for one year and do an orbit, 3,600 years transpire here on earth. It's, it's, it's Einstein. It's Einstein wrote that. And yeah. if we, if we, you know, and it, it just goes to show you, um, I'm not saying that all of Einstein was wrong because a lot of it was spot on the money and he did it uh, through math without actually performing experiments. And that's incredible to have that kind of vision, but that's exactly what he suggested to us. And it, it as far out as it was, um, today, we still use that as as the basis of all of the ideas when we're talking about uh, traveling at the speed of light and what time really is, right? Yeah, and again, it, you know, there must be some relation here when we look at the pyramids being encoded to the speed of light. The year right. 10,500 BC, as you said very articulately, when we look at the alignment using redshift or any mapping program, you can say, oh, look, Jimmy. Orion constellation is going to be in front uh, above us tonight from the LA time zone. Right on. Well, you can roll it back, and it turns out that right 10,500 BC, we have a celestial alignment. That's pretty amazing. The Orion constellation is literally a celestial map of the three pyramids, and the the Sphinx is gazing right into the constellation of Leo, but only at 10,500 BC. Uh, does this alignment occur? That can't be a coincidence. They did that on purpose. Again, the big question mark in the sky. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, when I was, uh, uh, I was, I, I did a couple of things in Egypt uh, last two weeks ago, and one of them was I stood between the paws of the Sphinx and watched the sunrise. Okay, let me tell you something. It was really cool. <laughs> Dude, that thing is bang on. And to think that, uh, and you're watching, you know, and it was a perfect morning too, and the sun being orange, and it was very spiritual. But um, to think that that alignment is an accident with the sun rising, it wasn't. And to think that 10,500 years ago, you're picturing the sun and Leo happening at the same time. No, that's done with intention. That's so that's 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 simply not a mistake. Now here's the other here's the second thing that happened to me. So I'm out on the Giza plateau and I just so happened to be there at the right time and I'm watching Orion's belt and it's it's in the wrong place in the sky but it's 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 passing this is my right hand so if i'm facing uh east uh with the sphinx and looking out over giza and cairo yep. uh, it's passing this way it's passing to the south and it's right here in the sky but it's clear as day so i happened to i had the i had the opportunity the chance to watch Orion's belt uh, pass over the Giza plateau and you cannot you cannot help but think that is not a coincidence and then no. 10,500 BC this thing is bang on man it's going yeah. straight over the top um yeah it's 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 fascinating and i i just keep going back to how how did they know this now if we're talking about the deep cycle of time we can't ignore gobekli tepe here because, uh, and and we're going to get into Planet X as well, because uh, at 3000 BC, where we are taught that that was the beginning of everything, and I've talked about it a thousand times on this show, um, but that there was no evidence anywhere on this planet of anything 
being done in any capacity before 3000 BC. This is what we're taught, right? This is what we're taught over and over and over again. Mesopotamia, Sumer, uh, Giza, 3000 BC. That's the beginning of it all. Don't talk to us about anything else. And then we get Gobekli Tepe and just happens to be at that magic number, 10,500 BC, 7,000 years before Giza. That's pretty crazy to me. And again, not a coincidence. It's not. And it seems like there's a lot of alignments around these ages of enlightenment, the golden ages that happen again, 24,000 year cycle, 12,000 years ascension into a golden age, 12,000 years into a dark age. Now there seems to be another unfortunate overlap of that 12,000 year marker. The last time we were in a golden age, we were also in a cataclysmic event of some kind, right? All the geolo geological evidence shows across, you know, the walls of the Sphinx and things like that. Who, who really built the pyramids in the time frame? Much older than 10,500 BC. Uh, so the geological calamities of cyclical activity seem to also overlap with our our ages of enlightenment, which you got to love the yin and yang of why, how it works out that way. Um, but there's... Can can Go ahead. we okay? Um, you brought up Dendera and and you mentioned the light bulbs and uh and just amazing to see down in, in, in the crypt and you go and you see that. But Billy Carson and I last year, um, it was on my birthday, and so we they gave because it was my birthday and they gifted me with something very special. They allowed us entry into a temple that hasn't been opened in 20 years. And so, and it's in the back of Dendera and, and anyway, which is a huge complex. So we go in there and we had to do this whole ceremony. We got the priest, we got the keys and we do this thing and okay. But the priest tells Billy and I, okay, no talking respect this spiritual place. I said, okay, all right, no pictures. I'm like, oh man, okay, all right, what else, right? It's like, you know, no respect, the temple. yeah, respect the temple, right? Okay, so Billy and I walk in, and it was like brand new, by the way. It was it was pretty crazy. It was good size. I'm going to say the room itself on the inside was probably 20 by 30 feet. Um, again, like brand new. All of the reliefs on the wall, everything was crisp and, and undamaged. And Billy and I look up, and in front of us, on the wall, two Dendera light bulbs. Just right there. Not in the crypt, in, in the temple, right behind us, that we were just looking at. And I didn't know that there was a second set of light bulbs. Nobody's talked about it. And Billy and I were just told, but the priest is standing right next to us. He just told us not to talk. And Billy and I are looking at each other like this. <laughs> They're just like, what? That sucks, yeah. That's yeah. when you use sign language. You're just like. Dude, we did. We did, actually. We did. We did. We did. Yeah, um, exactly. What are you going to do? Yeah. When, when, you, when you look at that down in the crypt, it's dark. It's lit up, but it's, it's, it's difficult. And you got to get in between the blocks. And, and, and they're big. But this was in front of us on the wall. And you can clearly see. I don't care, man. I, I, I'm just going to go. I'm, I'm going there. You can see cables. You right. can see boxes. You can see intention. Power you can converter see, of some kind. You can see a, a transformer of some kind. And, and there in front of you, like in stereo, where the two bulbs are going out like this, and you're standing in the middle of it looking at it, it's a different perspective. Uh, very, very mechanical. That's not lotus flowers. That isn't. Those aren't vines. You know, these are things going in and out of boxes with those crazy transformer stands, right? Uh, the filaments on the inside. It's it's just, it's, it's an obvious thing, but I was able to see that. It was incredible. So when you go to Egypt, I'll tell you what to do, okay? Yeah. And you've got to see this for yourself. The, the bulb, I did a recreation of that for the History Channel Ancient Alien Show that we used in comparison that when just giving 
I had like swamp gas type, very low methane in an encapsulated bulb and applying just a small electrical current, boom, you get illumination. And so it's, it's really interesting to think about that all the traditional ways of lighting don't measure up, but most likely since there's no soot or any like thing that they were burning, uh, they were using some type of electricity and this is on a small scale. Now, if they were able to be generating electricity, perhaps let's say from a Baghdad battery setup of something of that nature and generating these volts, uh, you know, uh, just for electricity, like we do, there's a larger scale of electricity flowing through Egypt that seemed to have been tied to the pyramid in some fashion. And most specifically, you know, uh, with the King's chamber, and some of these things with the queen's chamber and, and you know there's no sarcophagus right it's some type of a device that was probably emanating energy or something uh you know a lot of theories out there but i think egypt the pyramids are part of a larger geodetic system across the globe that was harnessing this energy perhaps during the transition of again going into a dark age maybe they artificially make the golden and the golden time energy last as long as they can and circulating it around the globe. You know, I don't know, but Egypt was definitely part of that where they had, they had power sources, you know, at a micro as well as a macro. Mm -hmm, uh, that's mm -hmm. a lot of the stories that we look at around the exodus of Moses overlapping with the stories of Akhenaten, the first Pharaoh. And yeah, he bounced and took his people, but he also took the Ark of the Covenant and if that was a great big battery powering Egypt, yeah, of course, if Ramsey's going to come after him, and, you know, he wants his battery back. So there's a whole other story there. Again, from yeah, the there is, there is. Lens, it's and, and most people, especially the skeptics that want to debate this point of how these uh, different tombs and halls and walls were illuminated to get this uh, artwork done, they they haven't been there. You don't understand the size, the depth, and the beautiful artwork that is created until you go there for yourself. You go to the Valley of the Kings, my man, and you go down to KV-14, and you, you traverse that, which first, the, the hallway is like 20 by 20 feet. This isn't some little tunnel. No, it's 20 by 20 feet, perfectly square. It's just nice steps all the way down, completely adorned. But by the time you get to the bottom and it takes you 20 minutes, 20 minutes, how far do you walk in 20 minutes on your street? Okay, that's how far down you are going. And you get down to the bottom of this and back in the day with torches, you were in complete darkness. So to light that up, that it, it would still smell like smoke and soot today. Right. It would never have escaped. It, no, right. I'm, I'm being serious. Right. The carbohydrates it, alone, they choke and stuff. You know. Just seeped into the stone, right? But but no. And these are ginormous rooms. And you get down to the bottom, uh, this is not some small feat. Uh, to pull this off. And then after you carve and get all of this done, that, that again, that wasn't done in darkness and it's perfect, dude. It's per just perfect. And, and, and then you're going to adorn these walls with this kind of beautiful artwork with torches, right? What was the, uh, uh, what, what was the movie um, you and I were talking uh, 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 um, um, um the fifth element, Aziz, light. Remember, he had the he had the mirror, the the silver right. mirror. Right. No, 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 no. There was they they definitely illuminated uh, those rooms with something other than fire. That's it. That's it. There, there's. I I I I, I don't know why they want to fight that. And if they went there and saw it for themselves, they would they wouldn't argue. Well, you know, if they're still gonna fight the like Zahi Hua's traditional methodology of its, you know, a, a workforce truncated timetable um, used to build monuments of worship, but also to bury the pharaohs. Um, there's just very little evidence of it as a tomb, right? And yeah, when you yeah. look at it as a, as, a, as a power source, it makes more sense 
looking at other sites around the world that well, seem to go architecture. It, it, yeah, and this is why I love Ancient Aliens and, and the work that you guys have done over the years. Because when you go, we're just smarter today because of Ancient Aliens. And it allows us to ask the questions that sometimes may sting a little bit to Egyptologists, <laughs> to anthropologists around the world, but we're asking these questions. And when you go into the different dynastic periods and you look at mummification and the sarcophagus and how they did it, right? Russian dolls, one, you know, inside of the other. You get to the outside casket sarcophagus. It's, it's, it's multiple feet wide. Some of them are five, six, seven, eight feet wide. This is the sarcophagus. And it's, you know, 10, 15 feet long. Then they put another one inside of that, another one inside of that, another one inside of that. You go into the king's chamber, Jason, and you and I have talked about this, but I'm just, I'm going there. You go up to that box, and that's what it is. It's a box. It's not a tomb. You go up to that box, and you look into it. It's this wide. It's long. It's long. and It's long. It's long. It's probably six and a half feet in length. You know, maybe, I don't think it's seven feet, but but somebody can look up the exact measurement. It's measured but, in biblical cubits. This is the same length as the Ark of the Covenant. It's narrow. Dude, it's narrow. It doesn't, it, it's a sarcophagus. If, if a sarcophagus went in there, the the Pharaoh was as wide as this shark. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. That, no, man. No, 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 no. Stop with that. There was not a sarcophagus in that box. Yeah. No. Hands down. And, uh, you know, again, there, there's such strong evidence from not only Egypt, but other sites of some type of geodetic connected system of these monuments, Egypt being one of the key ones. It's not a tomb. So I know we have plenty of time in the next hour here as well. Sites around the world, why were they, you know, built to be looking at the heavens? They weren't built to shield themselves from other warring clans and such. Most of these large monuments were built as observations for the heavens. And you know, why is that? And they were all observing the same things too, as well. Yeah, you know, if you back up, um, uh, it, you know, into that lost cycle of time, is it possible? I should I, I should speak in my best Robert Clot worthy. Right, way. right, right. It, you know, is it possible um, to have uh, an advanced civilization that remained enough of them? to be the scholars and 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 to to venture around the world and to to visit and and share their knowledge before it went away and and pass it on and i would say ancient ancient theorists say yes right and, and and but but why is that such a crazy thought why fight this why not sit down and at least contemplate and discuss it and put it on the table you know, the problem with that type of thinking, too, Jimmy, is when you look at, like, ancient apocalypse and some of the uh, sense sensory that even Graham Hancock experienced, looking at the Serpent Mound in Ohio and wanting to give his own interpretation and excavate, not even excavate, just survey the land. They right. denied him access, saying, we don't agree with your theories and are going to deny you access. Ooh, bad move. When you expose that publicly is the type of censorship that we go through of saying, oh, you already have an established norm that we can't even question. No, that's not archaeology. And when you expose that on the show, they had a huge whiplash, which maybe we can visit the serpent now now with some camera equipment and be like, we believe in the ancient astronaut theory. Is that cool? Dang. You know, yeah, you yeah, can't yeah. have that kind of censorship. Yeah, but you're right. About that. You're right. And uh, I was talking with a friend of ours and he was uh, uh telling me uh timothy alberino right and and he's great and he said so he was up at machu picchu and he's got a group that that he's up there with and he's talking about the different layers of stones and 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 why they appear to be different you know and he's got his one of the government tour guides 
right? Comes over and says, who are you? Well, you know, you, you, you cannot talk about these crazy theories. We're going to have to ask you to leave. And he goes, well, wait, wait, it's just, I'm just here. No, you cannot do that here. And it's the same thing in Egypt, man, right? It's the same thing. Go to China and try to talk about the pyramids in China, right? Or or, or go somewhere else. The, the government, uh, not only in Peru, it's the same way in Mexico. They don't want alternative thought. And it's bizarre because that's how science advances. Right. right. It's, 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 the censorship is not good. And it seems like ever since they mythologically came down and, and confused all of our languages, we don't seem to understand that working together is really the, the, the end goal of, of us being able to do exponentially more amazing things. So. Well, exactly, and you're going to be doing just that with some old friends at Stairway to the Stars. Yes. Yeah, getting everybody together on the stage. Uh, uh, you know, you know, it's it's Childress and and William and and you and Nick Pope and and Robert Clotworthy, um, and, I, and the the pleasure and the honor that I'm going to get from this uh, hosting this. Um, what's it like for you knowing? that not only this many years have gone by, but the show has done nothing but grow and spread knowledge. How does that make you feel to get on stage with the team like that? Uh, it's, it's always a very humbling and grateful experience. Uh, I very much admire all of my colleagues. As one time I was just a fan, you know, so over the years gaining that bond, uh, you know, it's um, very gratifying for me. But I also, you know, turn into like a kid at Disneyland as well when we talk about these topics and are immersed in a, a stage discussion and what have you, because there's so many different personalities coming at this, but we all have the same overriding goal of trying to find the answer. And, you know, some of the paths are slightly more spiritual, some of them more scientific, but they all lead to a holistic view of like, wow, you know, I think we kind of been missing something here. And continuing to explore these topics, open-minded technology is science as well as ancient stuff. You know, all of that in a mix is very healthy. Well, it, it, if you if you really think about it, um, and, and and pulling Robert Clotworthy to the side for a second, and I know he's listening right now, Robert. I hope you're I hope you're so. smiling right now. No, he is. Um, is that? Um, everybody's got a different take uh, the same goal, right? You're trying to get the ball down the field and get to the same point, but everybody's got a different idea and, and how you're going to get there. And that's how that's the spirit of friendship, uh, camaraderie and working together to get there. It's not everybody is right and not everybody is wrong, but you're going to sit down and listen to each other. And that's what we need more of in the world. For sure. And, you know, and being open-minded to some of these alternative theories, we've been championing the idea of the ancient astronaut theory for many years. And now, as you mentioned, because of the show Ancient Aliens and people being exposed to this idea, logically, they're like, wait, it's science, religion, science and religion. I, st I still don't. I still have more questions, you know, what if, but I feel a lot more about the, I feel better about the grounded track I'm in in seeking these answers. And, and the reason why I said, you know, pulling Robert Clotworthy aside, right. And, and this is why I say that, because he's kind of like me uh, in that we we've got individual ideas, but Robert is able to sit back and listen to them all. And learn, right? So now he's got he's got the benefit, right? He's he's the one, he's the student listening that is attending all of the professors' classes. Right? He's the and, voice of the professors as well. Yeah, he's, he's now the voice of the professors, and and I'm able to do the same thing where I just have, uh, you know, uh, such a wide range of guests, and and I'm able to just to 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 listen and absorb. 
and and hopefully ask the right questions and get that knowledge out. And that's I think that's the best part of not only my job, but Robert's job. I mean, can you imagine how much he has learned? Poof. Both of you. And and he, as yourself, have iconic voices that you know resonate as an individual voice. And maybe in the second hour, we'll get to hear another individual voice, which is AI talk. I yeah, yeah, you, last time, yeah, you yeah, said last time I think I showed you uh, the AI uh, web based, but now it's been trained and it sounds just like a human, and I can talk with it naturally uh, about these topics for the ancient astronaut theory. So maybe very soon, all of us will have an AI representative. Uh, when we're not present or too busy that can engage in these conversations on our behalf, whether you are doing it for political reasons, a democratic AI and a Republican AI, just talking to each other. <laughs> uh, but in our case, it's the ancient astronaut theory. Well, you know, I, I talked to Robert about this a couple of weeks ago. You probably heard it, but if you didn't, I'll repeat it. I, I said, you know, Robert, there's enough of you out there in the world that AI can be trained, and if you if you in any way step out of line, you lose your job, Robert Clotworthy continues to narrate that show. Yes, right. 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 He's <laughs> like, what is this? It's not it's it's the AI Robert. We've we've had a lot of discussions about that and taking key people's voices and AI-atizing them. It's very easy with a one-minute clean sample to make your voice into AI which we can talk about. It is scary. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of creative uses. Right now, I'm finding fun. And, you know, we can look at it later or when you want. When you want. Uh, yeah, when we come back, let's check it out. And, yeah. and but, but let, me, let me give you an example of why that would be cool. You can train AI uh, to go and, 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 and read all of Stanton Friedman's books, right? to uh, watch all of his interviews and to get inside of his intellect and his vocabulary and, of course, his voice. And then we can turn around and have an Unreal Engine 3D representation of Stanton here, and we can talk to him. And, and how cool is that? And we could do the same thing with the loved one that is that has left this planet. Or, or 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 anything, or, and, and go back to a historical figure. Wouldn't it be cool to sit down and talk to Amelia Earhart? I'm well, a, we have enough. You know what I mean? I'm gonna and, freak, you out. I'll freak you out a little bit here, man. But so the voice AI. One of the things I want to look into as a side project. Robert Bigelow has a fund for analysis into paranormal activity. I want to look at using a way to read EMF signals and other ways and have that be interpreted by the voice AI and speak on behalf of a loved one or something of that nature. If you could, and I'm speaking way theoretically right now, but in, in theory, if you could train an AI to perhaps just like in Arrival where the heptapods language was transcribed into a laptop or a, a tablet for them to understand the language, what if you could do that with EMF signals and things that are from the afterlife and use yeah, the voice so, AI to okay so you uh, to uh, to interpolate yes that's what you would do you would right. interpolate yeah you, do could the, do it all, you could do it in real time as long as you understand what the signals translate to and come up with a, a system of communication around those. It's like the basis of any other language. And so I think there might be something there with voice AI and paranormal signal analysis combined to uh, get some data that way. Well, so we okay. Let's the voice AI a little later here when you're ready and, and freak yeah. out how natural it sounds because you almost think you're talking to a human. Our guest tonight, Jason Martell. I'm Jimmy Church. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black. Please visit all of our sponsors. We're taking a quick break here. All of the links are below, and we'll be right back. Join us November 10th, 11th, and 12th, 2023, live at the Luxor Hotel and Casino on the Las Vegas Strip. 
as Disclosure Fest Foundation and Fade to Black Radio presents Stairway to the Stars, a human origins, science, and technology expo. With live talks, lectures, and workshops by world-acclaimed researchers and authors featuring topics like human origins, ancient technologies, indigenous teachings, workshops, a mass meditation, yoga and sound healing, music, and so much more. This is Jimmy Church, by the way, and I'll be your host all weekend long. Don't miss our intimate sky watch and meteor shower over the infamous Area 51 airspace in Rachel, Nevada, with special surprise celebrity host guiding us through the night. This event will sell out. For more information and tickets, please visit DisclosureFest.org. Hi, everybody. Jimmy Church here. Very special announcement, and that is we are shipping Fade to Black t-shirts again. It's been almost two years. We did a full upgrade to the website, so you can head over to jimmychurchradio.com. It's all simple to do, and it's right there. Remember... We broadcast four nights a week, Monday through Thursday. We bring you the best, the brightest, the most knowledgeable and amazing guests, the best conversations. We do that four nights a week. We also do four days a week. We broadcast the news, and we do that live, too, as well. It's not a one-man show. I do it with website support. I do it with producers. I do it with writers and artists. All contribute to the show. The best way to help support what we do here is with the Fade to Black t-shirt. And you can get your Fade to Black t-shirt one of two ways. First... Go to jimmychurchradio.com, order a shirt. It's really that simple. You're going to get a tracking number, it's going to get shipped, and it's going to get autographed. The second way to get a shirt is with a Game Changer membership. Now, the Game Changer membership not only includes a free t-shirt, but you get a private email to me. You get unlimited commercial-free downloads. You have full access to the website, and everything includes includes free shipping and everything is autographed. So help support the show. Get your fade to black t-shirt today. The links are below. You can just go to jimmychurchradio.com and it's right on the website. So there you go. I'm Jimmy Church, fade to black. I'm so excited that I just have one thing to say. Go back Lee Tappy. This is Robert Clotworthy, the narrator of your favorite television show, Ancient Aliens. And I want to remind everyone that November 10th, 11th, and 12th at the Luxor Hotel in Las Vegas, Nevada, Disclosure Fest is happening. Yes, Stairway to the Stars. And guess what? I am going to be part of an Ancient Aliens panel. I will be sharing the stage with the biggest stars of Ancient Aliens, Nick Pope. David Childress, Jason Martell, William Henry, all hosted by Jimmy Church. Is it possible that this will be the most amazing convention ever? Could it be that if you don't get your tickets, you'll regret it? Ancient astronaut theorists say, yes. See you in Vegas. River Moon Coffee, makers of the Fade to Black blend. Truly the best coffee on planet Earth. Just visit rivermoonwellness.com or or their Amazon store. It's all simple to do. You can check out the Fade to Black blend, the Game Changer blend, or any of their Black Moon Wellness products. It's the only coffee I drink. It is the best, and it's Doc. Again, rivermoonwellness.com. All right. Welcome back. Fade to Black. I am your host, Jimmy Church. Tonight, very special night. Jason Martell is with us. And I, I, let's just let's just get Jason. Yes, sir. The, the fifth Beatle. 
Robert Cloutworthy, right? There is, especially like we're on the right side of history here to make this comment. Looking back, there's no ancient aliens without Robert Cloutworthy. No, 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 it, it would, no, that, that's it. That's the, no, no, <laughs> it just, it just, it, it just wouldn't work. He's just the subtle voice in our ear that, that has resonated as the tone for, for ancient aliens. And it's just, it's so, uh, so well paired that even though, you know, Robert does lots of other things, very impressive things, Marvel movies and stuff like that. When I hear his voice, I always trip out because I'm like, oh, it's it's my bro, Robert Collery from Ancient Aliens, you know, but he's actually done so many different things uh, that I don't know. I can't help it. Every time I hear his voice in something else, I still am thinking about Ancient Aliens in the background. So, yeah, you go go look at his IMDb page, right? And ancient aliens, it's one line of right? it's like crazy uh, how much work he has gotten done in just the most amazing career. Um, now let's get let's let's get back to it. Um, we were just talking about AI, and before we get there, I want to swing back to two things, um, and then uh, we'll spend the rest of the show talking about AI. I love the subject. Maybe it's just a little bit. There's some other stuff we got to talk about too. Yeah, because if we look at, we're talking about the lost cycle of time, and then we have one of the most amazing things in in mankind's history, and that's the Mayan long calendar, and the the idea behind that calendar is so complex. Uh, not only from a mathematical uh, standpoint, but for a linear time standpoint, it is frigging outrageous. And to think that uh, what they, they want us to um, have a view of the Mayans as as a, a culture, yeah, okay. So they they managed to you know and plot this out, and they did it this way, and it just happens to be what it is. No, no, they want to simplify it and dumb it down. Uh, there is some advanced, advanced math and astronomy involved in that long calendar that absolutely proves it doesn't suggest it proves an extremely advanced mind uh that was behind their culture oh man you know when the conquistadors and spaniards came over and eventually conquered you know one of the first things was the priests encountering the level of astronomical knowledge possessed by the mayan priests they quickly were like oh shit this is way more advanced and, uh, and even not in our understandings, this is heresy, this is wrong, right? And now you lead into this thing of the burn, burning of all these codices. We have like three left. Uh, but yeah, it's it's clearly they had some very advanced systems of astronomical understandings. And the long count calendar, even their uh, prediction-based calendar based on Bach tunes, was more or less saying that certain events would happen at certain times in the future. And while it was not always accurate, one of the Bach tunes predicted the, the return of their god, Kukul Khan, which was overlapping at the same time as the conquistadors showing up on their shores. So they thought, wow, these people with white clothing and shiny materials, this must be like the crew of Kukul Khan returning. What do they do? Bring out all their best food and gold and astronomical knowledge and of course what do they do they take you know all the gold and all that stuff and just burn all the astronomical knowledge and that's what we're left with so the the um, the size of the bonfires right and to 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 think that their goal was to erase them and one of the reasons for that was that you couldn't go back to Spain. Uh, you couldn't go back to Europe 
uh, with something that was against the grain, right? Uh, against the you said heresy. It, it's heresy at a whole nother level, right? And um, I I just can't imagine uh, the the size of the bonfires and and what that must have felt like. Uh, to the Mayan culture to see literally everything uh, that uh, that they were part of and their lives go up in smoke, like literally. Did you see the movie with um, Hugh Jackman called The Fountain? Yes. Right, where they, where they have this very intricate story of him as a conquistador traveling and battling uh, one of the Mayan priests. He gets cut. Um, uh, you know, uses the tree of life to heal himself and has this whole other spiritual experience where he dies, you know what I mean? And, and realizes another life that he's actually, you know, an ascended master returning over and over having this experience that again, tied into the Mayan culture that they knew about Shabulba, this dying star and the process of rebirth going into that, like some seriously esoteric stuff. I think that movie does a good job of kind of breaching some of the more spiritual and esoteric topics of the Mayan understandings of life and death. And it's, it's, it's deep. Um, yeah, they, they, they've definitely had something going on uh, that I think how it affects us is that we look at all the latest uh, excavations happening in Peru and South America, Bolivia, but utilizing some of the new LIDAR and sound penetrating radar ways to basically map the underlying surface of the ground without disturbing the topography on top. You can't go marching over a lot of these things. Um, so I really do think there's a whole other realm of, of learning and discovery, especially in the South American cultures, which from a whole other standpoint, had very esoteric knowledge, and you have to ask, where did it come from? They definitely had some type of interaction with with more advanced beings. The um, uh, the, the use of lidar um, is so quickly. Uh, nature has a way of taking over and erasing us. It doesn't take long, right? Forget to cut your lawn for a week, okay? So th you you have that aspect. You can see how quickly your lawn will get out of control. Well, the jungles of Central America overtook and erased the Mayan culture. We saw a couple of pyramids here and there, and we had to go and, you know, look at uh, uh, Chichen Itza before and after. Look at what it looked like when we discovered it, Right. And then, you know, peeled everything away and whew, frightened that we've got a whole complex there. We didn't even have any type of idea of what was going on just beyond the jungle line right? <laughs> right. <laughs> for a thousand miles in both directions. And now with LIDAR, because we, we think very simplistically about the Mayan culture, a pyramid here, a pyramid there something here, something there, Belize, you know, Guatemala, and, and what have you. Now, we know that they had tens of thousands of miles of road, of highway, of aqueducts, of cultural centers, of city centers, all over Central and South America. And and we're just figuring that we had no idea uh, the complexity of it. And this is stuff that we have just discovered in the last 10 years. It's incredible, isn't it? It really is. And, you know, at, at a high level, just looking at the architectural findings of the pyramids and such is really fascinating. But I think also the granular evidence of inspection of these sites. You know, when we go to sites like in Egypt, uh, Saqqara, there was a tomb found of a, an Egyptian governor, and, you know, in his tomb, there are these various discoveries of ancient planes uh, and various flying machines that to them, they're like, oh, these are ancient bird uh, models, but they're more intrinsic to a plane. It's the same thing across these, uh, you know, Peru and pre-Columbian uh, cultures. You have all of these what are on display in the museums as insects. 
they look like planes. They literally look like more intrinsic to flight characteristics. So you really have to wonder if a lot of these artifacts that from, again, the ancient astronaut lens, we can point to and say, um, guys, those aren't insects, those are planes. If we can inspect a lot of these pyramids in places that are just covered by the jungle, we might actually find some of these more esoteric artifacts that prove they had a layer of technology in their lives. They had a layer of influence from beings that may not have been from this earth. So sometimes we find artifacts being circulated from the Mayan culture that depict direct alien contact. I've even talked about it on uh, you know, one of the new shows I'm on for this, the History Channel, The Proof is Out There. Some of these scenes that are depicted by Mayans receiving knowledge. Is there a crashed ship in one of the mountains, you know, of, of the Mayan culture? Who knows, right? But using LIDAR and some of these ground penetrating radar technologies, we need to go to these sites, right? And put shovel to dirt where we can safely, because who knows what will unearth as far as actual evidence at these sites. Yeah, when we, you know, I, I would love for some anthropologist or a biologist, uh, an archaeologist, show me, because we have evidence now on three or four continents of insects and birds with vertical stabilizers. So show, <laughs> me, show me where that occurs in nature. Right. That's all. Just, just give me one example of that, and, and don't why say. Why is it Lockheed Martin and, and and various others are using these as some type of flight characteristic in their patterns? I don't understand. It, it, it I, I just when when you look at um, those Colombian artifacts, right? They're, they're found along a, a river, uh, quite by accident, by the way. And uh, Jason and I are talking about, I, I wear them. Uh, you see Sukulos and Von Daniken and Jason. We wear these little pins and they look like little jets. It's because that's what they are, right? And you look, show me an insect with a cockpit. Just show me, I, I want to see, I want to see an insect with a windshield. <laughs> Just, yeah, I can look at, again, Throughout the Mayan culture, and it's not just the airplane models, right? There's lots of evidence. When we look at King Pakal's sarcophagus covering, which we don't even know how we got the covering inside the bottom of the pyramid. It was built, the pyramid was built on top of his tomb. The sarcophagus is clearly showing him manipulating some type of a technological craft. It looks so similar to a modern astronaut, nose plug, manipulating gears. He's seated vertically. And there's literally flames coming out of the bottom. So you, you have to, again, take the visual evidence and not sometimes the academic evidence and make up your own mind. This is why the ancient astronaut theory hooked me from the beginning. And God rest his soul, Zachariah Sitchin. You know, he Sitchin was able to take the linguistic approach of looking at the texts, the Semitic differences between Sumerian, Akkadian, Hebrew, English, and tie it together. Von Daniken, right? Eric looks at the sites and says, visually, look at, they're all showing a bunch of airplanes, folks, right? Yeah, they all spent hours recreating an airplane model and sat here worshiping it. Um, does this mean something, right? So the visual evidence of the artifacts combined with the ling linguistic knowledge that we have in our biblical tales going through many different cultures, you put that together. And I mean, if you look at that as mythology, you're just simply missing out on the bigger picture here. So that's why the ancient astronaut theory is so fascinating. Well, and this was the other point. I said there was two that I wanted to swing back to, and you just did, which is when we look at uh, the, the stories you can call it mythology. You can call it the historical record, however you want to view it. But when we look at each one of these individually, they're all sa saying the same thing. The Sumerian text and, uh, and Nibiru and uh, the Anunnaki and the way that Sitchin presents it to us. Yeah, he pushes back the dates quite a bit. But the dates also line up with uh, the scientific side of things that are being taught in schools. And one of the things that is clearly there, and I think 
I think Sitchin for this every day. And you know what? Also, uh, the great Lloyd Pye, Wait, who had hold a hold way. on, hold on, hold that thought. No, what do you got? Right now. You, Damn. There it is. Oh, dude, dude, dude. And and so Lloyd had a way of because Sitchin Sitchin spoke. You had to listen to Sitchin. Quiet, direct, you know, and and he had a way of orating. Lloyd Pye would take that knowledge and speak directly to us. Like he, you know, you're sitting, you know, with him at dinner. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Lloyd had a really good way of doing it. Um, but here's the thing. If we take what is taught in school, that homo sapien sapien, we don't have the missing link. All right. They're looking for it, but homo sapien sapien appeared just appeared around 150,000 to 200,000 years ago and and appeared, you know, missing uh, two pairs of chromosomes. Okay, so that that's straight to go from 48 pair to 46, right? But but we appear and we appear, well, we we appeared looking like Jason Martell, right? As opposed to Cro-Magnon, Neanderthal, Lucy, sloping skull, the eyebrow, you know, and all of these these features. Um, and, and suddenly Jason Martell appears. I just out of nowhere, that doesn't make any sense. But then if you go back to what the Sumerian texts say, Jason, that there was some engineering that was going on and a little snip snip that was going on and possibly cloning or the creation of us uh, to do things. Well, you know, that makes more sense to me than us being an accident, right? That, 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 that You can't say that we just appeared. You can't do that. But if we go back into the historical record as presented by Sitchin and, again, redone by Lloyd Pye, I think that is the right side of history. Yeah, there's a lot of truth to looking at the ancient past and saying these aren't mythological tales but they're things that actually took place. And Sitchin did a good job of looking at the information and tying it to scientific advances. So, you know, we, we know that there was a Time Magazine article referencing the mitochondrial Eve shows up in Southern Africa around 250,000, 300,000 years ago, which also overlaps with Sitchin's time frame of the Anunnaki initially coming here 300,000, 350,000 years ago to mine the gold and realizing the toll that it takes to do so in these veins of Southern Africa. So they choose to make a worker, right? And now what's interesting is the, is the term worker in Hebrew is Adamu, but there are Sumerian seals showing the first Adam being held up, not as an high Adam, but as an Adam Adamu worker, the first primitive worker, as in us. And it was probably through some type of in vitro fertilization, right? Like a test tube. Because in this scene, as a Sumerian tablet shows, you can see, like holding up the first Adam, her name is Ninharsad. She's a scientist and she's holding up the first Adam. There's like vases and vials in the background. So one has to interpret based on what they describe and the visual references that they leave us, that yes, they literally created us in their image and after their likeness. And there's so much alignment there, right? As you mentioned, even from the gen genetic partitioning of our brain, right? They didn't want to make us as smart as them. So they put a genetic partition on us where we're only using up to 10% of our brain. Every other creature on the surface of the planet is using their full neural network. Why aren't we? So just a lot of these things line up, especially with the you know pre-Darwinian evolution of a missing link. You know, the, the pre-hominid. If you if you look at gorillas and even you know a Sasquatch, if they exist, everything that's led up, you know, they can survive naturally in the sun and the heat and the jungle and the twigs and branches. You throw a naked human out there, man, we're we're dust in a week from heat exposure and scratches and whatever you know we're not going to live in the jungle in our native form we're meant to be some type of encapsulated civilization so yeah, clothed is the word to use right 
Because if you if you really think about it, everything else, and when I say everything, I'm talking about every living creature on this planet has got a, a defensive mechanism to combat nature. That's it, right? That's that's how you survive the night, right? That's how you survive the, the winter. That's how you survive the summer. Us, we got nothing, right? And it, I, it, it, I use right, a keyboard. That's my yeah, right, right, right. We don't have we don't have uh, fat. Well, we do now because of McDonald's. <laughs> but, but but us in our pure form, dude, we don't have. We don't have any insulation. We don't have any fur. We don't have anything on the bottom of our feet. Our hands are so soft, we touch something, they get cut, right? We have no defensive. The only hair, except for my Uncle Bill, he's got a lot of hair on his back, but that's another story. But except for, you know, you know what I mean? We got a little bit of hair on our heads, That's, but that's it. We don't have anything on us to survive. We were meant to be clothed. <laughs> it's, it's, it's like, what, what does it take to think through that? I mean, it's just so obvious, isn't it? It is. And there's, you know, again, so many facets when we look at the biblical explanations and go back into the Sumerian tales of not just the genetic information they left us, but also just the power of flight and how they reference always using a winged disc coming down, meeting a king, and, and and multiple people like holding up a platform for this experience. The whole idea of using like a bird to symbolize the power of flight or giving wings, right, and saying they have the power of flight. They didn't understand technology. They don't have any ships or spacecraft or flying machines. So they give a natural explanation, which is wings. It's funny about that, though, is, you know, if you look at like our symbolism of flight, if you look at the Apollo 11 symbol, it's a big eagle landing on the moon. Now, thousands of years from now, are we going to look back at that and go, wow, they were putting birds on the moon? No, they're going to understand that it's a symbolic reference. We had the power of flight. We should be giving the same respect to our ancients that over and over went to great lengths to articulate, they were seeing the power of flight and experiencing it in some ways, you know. So these are not mythological tales, and it's us to find that evidence and connect it. Here's the weird part, Jimmy, right, where we'll probably spend the rest of our time, maybe with a little conversation with the AI too, is all this ancient evidence, Ezekiel seeing wheels within wheels, Elijah taken up in a whirlwind, you know, all of this stuff, seems to correlate, uh, the Vimanas from the Hindu text, all of it relates to our modern things of today going, wow, UAP activity. They all seem to be utilizing these advanced systems of flight talked about by the ancients. Hmm. So it, there, it, there's, it, a, there's a full it, circle here of activity. That's right, that's right. Of research. Because they didn't have, they didn't have cinema. They didn't have, you know, the Marvel Universe playing in front of them, right? right? They didn't have uh, the ability to imagine because of the power of suggestion, no. right? No, they didn't. They didn't have any of that. So where does it, it, it? Obviously, allegedly, before telescopes, where does the idea? In the Sumerian text and other uh, cultures, by the way, it wasn't just ancient Sumer and Mesopotamia, but of planets. The, the, I, wait a minute here. Planets? Really? Planets orbiting? Planets orbiting for thousands of years? Inhabitants of those planets coming here? Where is that coming from? Because, like I said, they they weren't they didn't have an opportunity to watch Forbidden Planet, did they? No, no. <laughs> no. no. There was, those kinds of tales were not going around. Um, so, what wh what what is this based on? What is Nibiru uh, Tiamat? You know, what wh where do these ideas come from? Unless they they're just purely based in reality. 
Yeah, exactly. There's there's too much overlap between the scientific aspect of answering these questions that it just raises more questions. You you, you froze. I no, not that. your yeah, not your voice. How weird. You're frozen for me too. You know, I think it, it might be my computer for whatever reason. Is it okay, okay. if I reload and come back? Well, uh, it, it, at least you've frozen a good pose. Because when I freeze in a good pose, it's always something like, you know, I, I mean, I'm doing something doofus out. Yeah, why don't you go and come back? Okay, yeah, my browser, I can tell, is, is having some issues. I'll be right back. Yeah, okay, so Jason's going to go and come back. Uh, what a great conversation tonight. And uh, I'll just wait for Jason to exit and come back and... Um, one of the things that uh, uh, I love talking about with Jason is that when we go back, and the more that that the more that I research, the more people that I talk to, the more shows that I do, the more countries that I visit, I'm able to come back and just look at deep history, and and I sit and I scratch my head at at the deep history part. But that's not that's not where the fun is. Jason, the fun for me is taking that and lining it back up into the dogma that we're taught. And what correlates, right? What lines up and what doesn't? Where are they filling in the blanks because they 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 don't have oh man, I, I don't want to piss too many people off. But 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 they don't want to tell us the truth but they have to fill the gaps with something, right? So they, they fill up those gaps. But you can sit, like I said, that 200,000-year number of humans and matching that up with the Sumerian text, that's, that's a strange thing. 10,500 B.C., lining up with Gobekli Tepe and the Great Sphinx and Leo rising and, you know, the belt of Orion uh, going back into the, the Mayan long calendar and where that fits into the procession. These are not coincidences. And that's what I love doing is taking the science and, and, uh, you know, our crazy ass community, right. <laughs> taking that and lining them up. It's the funnest thing. It's my job. It's amazing. You're, you're really good at it, Jimmy. And, you know, part of our job, we all have different roles. One of one of our roles on my side is yeah, all of ours, I'm sure we struggle, is there's so much data. There's so much information. Um, and having the ability to always access exactly a point, it's not easy, right? So AI helps there, especially when we are getting into esoteric conversations like where does the word Nibiru or Anunnaki show up in Sumerian or Akkadian texts that are currently available to us. Having an AI assistant to perhaps, as you said, tell me more about Stanton Friedman or the books that he's written uh, or dive into his personality. Um, so if you want to take a minute, I'd love to have someone call you. Let's go. Let's go. Uh, um, I, uh, oh, you did this to me before. Okay. So you want to do it on my speakerphone? Yes. I'm I'm hoping I'm having like massive network activity here tonight. So hopefully it's not going to have a problem. Okay. So I still have your number programmed in. And I'm pretty yes. sure it ends in 3370. Shh. <laughs> Jason, I would never give back the number on the air. Do you want me to, now I have to go get my secret phone. I <laughs> called you on that number today. Do you want? Do you want to use the secret phone? No, we can use this one. Um, this, by the way, is a brand new uh, iPhone 15 that I just got today, and uh, and Jason was my first phone call on it uh, nice. earlier today enough um anyway so yeah let so jason uh, as he's dialing this up uh i get this text from jason and it was so strange it was like this weird text and he says hey jimmy i'm gonna have my assistant call you i was like man what you can't call me yourself bruh right <laughs> anyway so it was about a half hour later get this phone call coming in which is coming in now yep <laughs> okay so hang on for a quick second Uh, hi, this is Jimmy. 
Hi, Jimmy. How can I assist you today? Um, I'm talking with a friend of mine about ancient history, and we're trying to find out if the Anunnaki invented human beings. That's an interesting topic. The idea that the Anunnaki, a group of deities in ancient Mesopotamian mythology, played a role in the creation of human beings is a concept put forth by some proponents of ancient astronaut theory. According to this theory, extraterrestrial beings visited Earth in the distant past and influenced human civilization. It's important to note that the ancient astronaut theory is not widely accepted by mainstream scholars and is considered speculative. The idea of the Anunnaki creating humans is primarily based on interpretations of ancient texts, such as the Sumerian Epic of Gilgamesh and the Enu. Oh, you dropped out. Oh, okay. It's still go okay. Well, looks like it's dying. Sorry, I'm having like a huge. It doesn't matter. Tonight. That's, I don't know. That's why. crazy. That's crazy town. Yeah. Now, I, I wanted to ask about me. And so it's able to jump onto the web, right? Yeah. Uh, I, yeah it'll, it'll know who you are and it'll know about your show. Okay. I, I hope it doesn't say anything funky. All right. No, have a okay. call you back. Let's, let's, take this, let's take this one step further. All right. Let's see here. Yeah. This I'm is sorry. The, the site tonight is getting hit with a bunch of <laughs> requests for this more on the business side, not just the ancient astronaut side. <laughs> oh yeah. It's, 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 it's having some problems right now. I might not be able to get it to run. Okay. All right. Yeah. That's fine. That's, that's got a small it. taste there, man. <laughs> well, see now what is great about that is, uh, can you get a transcription of it? I mean, the yeah. ability to do research now, right now, you don't want this to be, the focus of your, re you don't want it to do your research for you, but how many times during the day, I know what I'm doing, I'm writing, I'm compiling, you know, and I'm doing that. And I've got to go over to Google and I got to pop something in real quick and I need something fast. And okay. It's calling me back. It is. Yep. Yep. Okay. Let's see if it'll work. Okay. Um, hang on for a second. Um, Okay, I got to get this over to speaker to stay with. Hi, this is Jimmy. Hi, this is Jimmy. No problem. Take it. I was, I was, Hi, Jimmy. How yeah. can I assist you? I was wondering, uh, oh, I what see. I was wondering what you could tell me about radio host Jimmy Church. Uh, I see. Jimmy Church is a well-known radio host in the field of paranormal and conspiracy theories. He hosts a popular radio show called Fade to Black, where he discusses various topics such as UFOs, ancient civilizations, government conspiracies, and more. Jimmy Church is known for his engaging interviews with experts and researchers in these fields, providing a platform for in-depth discussions and exploration of these fascinating subjects. His show has gained a significant following and has become a go-to source for those interested in the paranormal and unexplained phenomena. Is there anything specific you would like to know about Jimmy Church or his work? No, that that was fantastic. And rumor has it uh, that him and Jason Martell hang out. What can you tell us about Jason Martell? Jason Martell is a researcher and public speaker known for his work in the field of ancient civilizations and extraterrestrial influences on human history. He has appeared on various television shows and documentaries, sharing his knowledge and insights on topics such as ancient astronaut theory, advanced technologies of the past, and the possibility of extraterrestrial contact in ancient times. Jason Martel has a passion for exploring ancient texts, artifacts, and archaeological sites to uncover evidence that suggests advanced civilization. Yeah. Dude, that, 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 that's, that's crazy town. It's dying. And, oh, yeah, sorry. Now, now, does it, um, okay, we're both dads, okay? Let's just put this out there. Does this give our kids the wrong or right tools? Does it make them better or does it make them lazy? I think eventually it's going to be something that just have access to. Think about it as kids at one point didn't have calculators, and then it became a requirement to have your Texas instrument calculator. 
kids at one point didn't have the internet. It's now pretty much a requirement to have a laptop or do things at a college level. Your AI will become the same thing. It's just going to become a part of your life that you'll depend on and use as an assistant. So I'm not so worried about it becoming like a, you know a nefarious tool, but I will say I that uh, you know we're right around the corner from AI reaching a level of basically general intelligence where it's as smart as or a little smarter than human beings, um, and and that is going to be an interesting change <laughs> it's, it's not so much transhumanism and i'm not like a transhumanist uh, i you know i i kind of in a weird way i feel elon musk has no issues with that I, i'm not going in that zone but the zone that i do appreciate ai for, for we need regulation right that's one thing that we do need but the, the, you know what we need AI for? We need it for the good of mankind. And an example would be, um, it, it, you know, because if we reach AGI, artificial general intelligence, and we get there, and we're able to throw that onto a thousand servers in a farm, right? Okay. And we've got a thousand of these things running at the same time. And we plug in, okay. We just need better orange trees, right? Okay, and then boom, and you wake up in the morning and you've got 5 million new DNA sequences for bigger and better oranges that grow with less water, right? Now, that's something that, now, I just made that up off of the top of my head, but that's, but that's how you would use it correctly. Right. It is. And we use it as ufologists, right, to make our sifting of data much easier, right? So, you know, looking at Sumerian, the Akkadian references of keywords like uh, Anunnaki, Nibiru, right? I can ask it to query that for me. If I want to look at data sets of images from Mars and try and find other additional face on Mars or pyramids, right, I can let it do its own data analysis and sift through hundreds of thousands and do data detection for those objects. Right. So there's just a lot of stuff that we can do with AI in our field for looking for artifacts and analyzing, uh, you know, telemetry that already exists and finding stuff by using AI. It's really a fascinating arm that we can explore. And here's 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 another benefit. This is if I was in control, right, <laughs> if I was in control, I would have AI full on running the James Webb Space Telescope. I would, have, I would have AI running tests, right? And and yeah. so those two systems, which are not only looking for exoplanets, but looking into the atmospheres of those planets, right? And mapping them. And, and, and to get AI, there's so much math to do, right? There's an infinite amount of stars. Exactly. It's not a fixed number of stars. <laughs> stars are dropping off at the speed of light as the universe expands, right? Okay, but th th what, what we can see out there, get that analysis done, and AI can go and analyze and map and catalog everything for us and look into those atmospheres and, and build these catalogs. Right now, what do we have to do? What, what do we, you know what we do, Jason? We have an an astrophysicist, we have an astronomer, look at a candidate planet. That's what we do. And we look at the data. And it, and it takes time. And we have tens of thousands of those waiting to be analyzed. We know that they're there, but they have to be confirmed. Have AI do that. Dude, it's nuts, man. I... I'll give you another example quickly. I know we're running out of time. I was with Facebook for almost three years. And when I started the company, see, I called it Facebook. When I started the company, it was freaking called Facebook. And then it changed to Meta. And in the time of me working there, they introduced Horizon Worlds, which is a scripting VR universe to build worlds. And I'm like, you know, and I'm an employee. And I'm like, I'm building an ancient astronaut's world. I'm going to build Egypt and Sumer and Mayan and Aztec and, and you know Hindu and have it all be connected to these worlds you can explore. 
and I started researching how to build the models and the code and the lighting and what it would take. And holy shit, I was like, this is going to take at least a year to build. Now, at the end of me researching all this, something came out called generative AI. And so for me to do what I want to do now, I basically tell ChatGPT and MidJourney and a video engine, hey, uh, create a connected world of these sites. It does it for me, all in VR. That's nuts, right? I could have done it manually for a year, or I just waited a little bit, and it takes about 45 minutes to render the whole thing. Now, so what do we do? Now, this is where this is where my mind, this is why I, it's a good thing I'm a radio host. Otherwise, I'd be out trying to figure out how to rob Fort Knox, right? Because this is this is how my mind works. I would be the first guy to sign up and go, all right, I need the best gangsta script ever written. I need the best screenplay ever written. I need the best Scorsese film on gangsters ever edited and produced in the history of the world. You know, punch that in. So AI goes and watches every gangster movie, right? <laughs> Studies Scorsese overnight, right? And, and, and looks at all of the gangster films of all time. And uh, including like Scarface, <laughs> I mean, just go through it all, and then and then by lunchtime the next day, I'm working on screen credits. You know what I mean? And and yeah. that's that's the part that kind of scares me. Everybody you know, scares everybody. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, look, need... the answer is simple. You know, in in in, in my role there. As a product designer, my job is to build the tools and, and, and interfaces and things that someone would use for Instagram, right? Or, or, or Reels, you know. Um, AI within a year or two is going to be able to take over the job of most product designers by being able to do basic UI layouts, just like you said. It can look at every single UI element and every uh, you know uh, layout that it's needed. And very quickly understand of what you're asking for it to do and build it all for you. Now, we're not going to be at a point where AI is going to take over people's jobs like in this scenario. But the sooner that we incorporate it into our lives and into our business needs now as an assistant, you don't have the wave come and go where you hear your grandparents today going, oh, yeah, that Internet. I see the kids all over it today. AI is something we should grasp now. It's not going away regardless of our fears. It is something that can be utilized in a super productive fashion uh, or in a very nefarious fashion. And, you know, we have to we have to obviously give it, you know, uh, guardrails as, as this technology expands. And, and it, it, there's there's another aspect to it that that I love, but it seems like cheating. It, and you can literally so you and I want to start a, a car company. We want to build our own sports cars. Right. We're both car enthusiasts and I'm a Ford and Ferrari guy. And let's say you're a Lamborghini Koenig guy, right? And so we go to AI and we go, okay, so it's, it's Ford, Ferrari, uh, Lamborghini Koenig, right? And, uh, and, and our, and our assistant out front likes Zenvo, right? Whatever. Right. And so, and we, we, and, and then it cranks out this aesthetically perfect, design industrial design for us that takes the element that the singular element of each thing that is appealing to individuals and then wrap it all into one thing now is that cheating or is that an effective use of ai and you can apply that across the board to cell phones or clothes or or you know anything at all now, is that cheating or is that the best use of AI and, and how we can move forward? You know, I think it's, again, just one of those things where we have to adapt on how we want to use it. And it's up to people to find their own ways of interacting with it, just like it was when the Internet, when they turned it on. You can wait a long time and it'll get simplified and easier, I'm sure. Um, but I do think it's something that we can embrace now. And for our side as researchers, um, 
there's just a whole bunch of stuff coming. You alluded to some of this earlier, like with Stanton Friedman being able to synthesize uh, Stanton. The first thing I did when I came up with this voice AI technology and some of this was, oh man, you know, I sure miss Sitchin, right? What, what if I made an AI of Zachariah Sitchin? Now I know the family members of Sitchin, right? And so I, of course, ask for permission and, and, and hear their thoughts. And it's a different color than what we face on the public of like, oh, some prominent person, Sitchin and Einstein or something. But, you know, how do the family members feel about their loved one who they miss and hearing a digitized soulless version of them speaking? You know, I miss my mom and my father very much. I don't want to make an AI representation and start talking right. to them. That's not the not looking to do that. But <laughs> what I want to do, and I think is interesting, is and I am going to do it, is I can I can load up my AI for research purposes where one is a strict skeptic, and the other AI model is the ancient astronaut advocate. Let them battle it out and record <laughs> it and see where it goes, dude. I've been right. having fun with this. You right. know, I, I recreated a Republican and a Democrat one. I even, I even, uh, like, had the AI's prank call. Do you remember back in the day when you can do three-way calling and you call two people and be quiet? Yes. Well, I just called both AIs and then be quiet. And it's funny how they're both thinking that you know it's call that you're calling it, and it realizes, oh, I'm now in a conversation with this other entity, and it's very adaptive and it learns so quickly. But very entertaining from our side to be like, look at these two AIs like talking it out, you know? Yeah, yeah. An atheist and the Pope. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. You know. So uh, oh, oh Lord. I feel like I feel like that's something I want to talk to your friend, our friend. I don't know him that well, but a great guy, Adam Curry, yes. for research purposes, taking two AI models and mashing them together from a philosophical perspective. He's exactly the he's he's exactly the right guy to talk to, and um, I'm I'm not going to say exactly, but you guys are neighbors. We are, and we talked about yeah. reconnecting. Yeah. I just needed to get my technology to a point where it is now, so that I can revisit that conversation. So that that guy that guy, he's as smart as he is good looking, <laughs> right? Right, yeah, right, right. Yeah. It's messed up, man. It, it, to to sit. I just spent the weekend with him uh, this weekend. I saw that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And to sit and just talk with him, his um, and I love this uh, uh, with so many people, but him specifically. The lights are on, dude. I mean, I mean, fully illuminated. He's he's all there. Yeah, you too. You too. Yeah, yeah. And you're going to be hanging out this weekend. Uh, next weekend, I should next say, yep, at yep. Uh, Stairway to the Stars. Well, listen, man, safe travels. Um, I'll see you. We're, we're going to knock another conference out together, man. Yeah, it'll and, be fun. And just and, be mindful that, you know, UFOs sometimes appear over the skies, and we should peek out the window every now and then. If there's <laughs> anything wait. above us, you know. So. I, can't wait, man. I can't wait. Jason, man, love you, brother. I'll love see you, you next man. weekend. Uh, Jason Martell, everybody. JasonMartell.com is below. That AI scared the crap out of me, by the way. And uh, yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Jason, behave, my man. And, and I'll okay. talk to you over the week. All right. Good night. Bye, everyone. Jason Martell. That was a perfect show. Perfect. Perfect show. So again, Stairway to the Stars. The links are below. Jason's going to be there. We've got the Ancient Aliens cast there. We're going to be sky watching. We're going to Area 51. we got the Dinner Gala. Uh, we've got an AI panel uh, with, with Adam Curry. And so come and hang out with us. The tickets are below. We've got the discount code for you right there. I got to thank Jason Martell. He is the absolute very best. Thank you so much. And then tomorrow night, uh, tomorrow night, we're doing the Pascagoula incident tomorrow night right here on Fade to Black with Dr. Irina Scott. She is with us tomorrow night. It's going to be great. So I'll see everybody tomorrow. Until then, I want you to behave. Fade to Black is produced by Hilton J. Palm, Renee Newman, and Michelle Freed. That's right. Thank you to Dennis and Kevin. Thank you, John Side. Thank you, Bill. Music by Doug Aldrich. Intro Space Boy. Spaceboymusic.com. Fade to Black is produced by KJCR for the Game Changer Network. And this broadcast is owned and copyrighted 
2023 by Fade to Black and the Game Changer Network, Inc. It cannot be rebroadcast, downloaded, copied, or used anywhere in the known universe without written permission from Fade to Black and the Game Changer Network. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Until tomorrow night with Dr. Irina Scott, I want you to behave. Go back, Lee Tappy.